Crank up the volume and get ready for real-world bird hunting by listening to the Wingman Podcast by Eastman's. Now your host, Todd Helms. Hey, Wingman, Todd Helms with another episode of the Wingman Podcast and revisiting a friend from a previous episode, Chad Carmen with uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, but he's a big time, uh, he's a huge bird hunter. <laughs> you can say that. Dude, how you been? I've been good, man. Um, had a kid in January, or my first son, and so life's been a little bit of a whirlwind for me the last few months, but uh, managing to get used to the new normal and get by on a whole lot less sleep. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> I have been impressed, by the way, because um, I, w- I, w- I was giving you grief the last time you were on about your wandering gypsy Labrador hunt test life that you like to lead. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, that'll change when you when you're not a dink anymore, you know, the dual income, no kid. But uh, you're still getting after it, dude. I see the pictures. Your heart, your hunt testing the kids with you. Good on you. One hundred percent, man. We uh, we I, I have not going to nearly as many, so I can't say that I'm living the gypsy lifestyle <laughs> anymore. But uh, you know, my wife and I made a pact that we weren't gonna we weren't going to change our lives and we had kid, we were going to bring our lives, our kid into our lives. And we have done that. And he joined us at uh, our treasure state retriever club test a couple of weeks ago. And I think the gallery and the judges loved him just as much as they loved watching the dogs work. And he had a blast watching all the dogs and had a good time. So um, he might be hooked at five months of age. Heck yeah. Good for you. What's his name? Graham. Graham. Love it. it. It's funny. We picked the name Graham and we thought it would be extremely unique because neither of us knew any Grahams and uh, we just kind of finally settled on it. And there's a Graham T in his day school or in his daycare. There's a Graham R in his daycare. There's like three other Grahams and we never knew any of them until we had our son. Um, so apparently it's not as unique as we thought it was going to be. But That is um, wild. That is classic. wild. Yeah, that's a good name, man. It it doesn't matter, I think, what you name your kids. There's all you're always gonna find somebody who's got the same name. You know, it was we went through name lists when we had our all three of ours, and uh, we went a little bit different route. But yeah, the one kid thing didn't. It was the same for us, man. It was like the kid comes along and you. We said the same thing. It's not going to change what we do. We're just going to take the kid with us. And we still do that, even with three. But it's a lot harder. (laughs) A lot harder. Everyone's told me when you go from uh, two to three, you're going from man to man to zone defense. And it just gets a whole lot harder to stay efficient there. So, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. And everybody that's got that has had more than three tells us you might as well have four or five because at that point you're outgunned anyway. And you could just, you know, play a one, three, one and get it and just go for it. They're all taking care of themselves by that point in time. So you might as well just keep rolling. Yeah. It's my seven year old has gotten to the point where she can, I was actually working with Hondo in the backyard last night. I, I looked out, I was just fresh home from work, sitting there talking to my wife and I look out and my seven year old has both my labs at heel throwing a stick in the backyard and oh, that's perfect i was glad she's glad to see it but she was they were she was letting them break and you know it was it was playtime is what it was and so i went out and and kind of was like hey i'm glad you're doing this i'm proud of you that's really awesome but let's not instill some bad habits here let's <laughs> let's let's try to let so i went and got a bumper out you know and and then it was it was more fun but it it's neat to see that she's emulating some of those things that I'm working on and that she likes to do what we like to do. And getting back to your point, I think that is a direct byproduct of bringing your kid into your life and not making your life revolve around your kids. Absolutely. It's a, it's a family ordeal. And I mean, I I can't wait for the day that Graham's old enough that I can get him to throw some bumpers um, even just working with Buddy's kids and, and their dogs, I've found 
Um, you know, my older dog Buster is phenomenal as far as letting little kids um, work with him. And uh, if you know Tom McMillan, a uh, number of years ago, his son Gatlin, I think we were up at his place in Kansas and uh, Gatlin just thought it was the cutest thing in the world, the coolest thing in the world that he could sit there and throw him, throw things for him. And he wouldn't move until he said his name, Buster. And I mean, you're talking, this is a well, four or five-year-old kid yeah. at the time yeah. and just thought it was the greatest thing ever. And uh, I don't know, man, um, bringing the sun into it, it just seems like it makes everything that I do just that much more fun, right? Um, so it's been a neat experience. No, man, you're, you're, and you're in for more and more treats as, as Graham grows up and gets older, you're going to keep doing more and more and more and more cool stuff. You know, it's the guys here on the office tease me because when it comes to big game stuff, it's almost like if I can't involve my family, my wife and my kids, I'm really not that interested. It's kind of, it's kind of like to do the whole hardcore backcountry solo thing anymore. I get up there and in about two days, I'm like, this sucks. I want, I miss my kids. I miss my wife. You know, I'm not, I'm not the hard 20 some year old that I used to be. That's for sure. But it's fun. You know, it, it's, and I think that's, what's great about what we like to do so much with waterfowl is it's easy to incorporate the family into it. And I'm excited to see what you've got in store this fall. And you don't, it's, it's easy to incorporate the family, but like you said, that hardcore back country, I mean, when you're gone for multiple days and you miss bedtime or you do, you know, you're not there to, to wake him up, get him out of his crib, whatever it is, it just kind of, it kind of stinks, right? Like your priorities change, like you said. And I'm, I'm thankful that I am in, into waterfowl as much as I am because fortunately we have good enough waterfowl around here that I have a, a pretty good feeling that, you know, I can get up before he's up and I can be home by noon or two o'clock and still have the rest of the afternoon to spend with him and my wife. And uh, I mean, I went, I went bear hunting one time this spring and I missed bedtime and I decided I was not going to bear hunt it anymore this spring. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah it's you know like i said they oh you're soft whatever it's like yeah that's fine i'm soft i'm big, big teddy bear but your priorities change at least mine did and i and i still like to get away i still like to, to go in the back country i still like to hunt big game but it is much more difficult to put that other stuff aside and not and not let it be a distraction and my my I don't know about your wife my wife is phenomenal it's like when I'm gone when I'm hunting she does not bother me she doesn't expect a phone call she doesn't expect text messages I'm hunting I'm gone and she holds down the fort handles it how she does it as effectively as she does with three of them dude it's phenomenal she'll leave me like run to Cody for groceries or something and <laughs> I got all three of them like the time she gets back how'd it go and I'm like ah, you know the, the little guys in bed sleeping and the other two are out back yeah whatever we, we <laughs> handle it but yeah it's funny how your priorities change that's for sure and and I, I love how bird hunting especially waterfowl just lends itself to that family time I love taking my kids man love it waterfowl and dog training in general right I mean that's that's been the cool thing is that uh, I've tried to make up my time that I'd normally be spending um, bear hunting or turkey hunting early in the spring doing a few more closer to home I mean I don't spend the whole day dog training like I would have last year but it's really easy to throw them on a front, front pack I put on little earphones on them so I'm not blowing a whistle in his ear um, I've got a backpack carrier on the way right now, and I plan to go out and do a bunch of dog training with him on a backpack carrier, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a neat experience. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. You know, it's, I, I have to ask you too, um, you know, we're kind of in that time frame. I've got Hondo is, oh man, he's a little over a year right now. And I, I really pressed pause last winter and just focused on obedience and heel work and steadiness and it's paid dividends for me because I feel like he's taking to some of the other drills we're starting in some more advanced stuff working on hand signals working up to the t-drill and like last night I had two place boards on either side of the yard these things are 50 yards apart I have a pretty big backyard they're 50 yards apart and I he's I've got him in the middle and I'm like place and he'd go right to it sit turn look place 
bam, he'd go to the other, he'd go the other way. And it, by working on the, on place all winter long and some of that stuff, now that he's a little bit older, I mean, he's full of energy, but holy smokes. But what are you, what, what was your winter routine like? Cause I know, you know, I know some of the guys I talked to days are short all over the country. It's hard after work to get out. What does it look like for you? Yeah, the majority of my winter, um, I, I spend because I do so much competition stuff with my dogs as well. Um, I mean, I hunted like crazy. I tried to get out right, at least right. two, maybe three times a week. We had a phenomenal goose season, but with hunting comes a lot of bad habits. So um, I had someone, and this is such a simple thing to do, but I had someone the last year ex- talk to me about um, dogs knowing the difference between hunting and training. And if you take a bumper with you, when you go hunting and you see something hunting wise that develops a bad habit, maybe they break, maybe they take a cast and, or they don't take a cast, like a cast refusal in my world, right. Or popping on a whistle, just something that's a bad habit, but you have some of those materials there with you to be able to fix it right there and on the spot or after the hunt's over. Um, my, a lot of my winter routine consisted of hunt and then spend 15 minutes after the hunt, fixing whatever problems we might've just created. Now, fortunately, because we stay on top of it, um, guys that, that hunt with me, they kind of laugh because I'm not, I'm not hard on dogs at all. Right. I I, I'm a big believer in positive attrition. Um, and I I'm just not a forceful dog trainer, but I'm very strict when it comes to, I don't let my dog get away with things. So there's a huge difference in those two things, huge difference. Right. And I'm a big believer in denial of retrieve. So if my dog takes two steps off of their place board or off of their mutt outside of their mutt hut, if they do anything wrong that I don't want them to do, they don't get that bird. And I put them back in and I will get up and I will walk my happy butt out into that field or I'll wade out into the water. If it's on a river, we let it float and we get in the boat and go down and get it. And my dog doesn't get that retreat. And, you know, I, I, we talked about it last year. I've got now a two and a half year old. So it really was her first prime hunting season this last right, year. Right. And, and I've found out as long as you don't let them get away with that early on in their lives, it pays dividends the rest of their careers. Um, and, you know, I've got Buster, my, my 11 year old, or will be 11 in August. And I haven't had to worry about any of that stuff for years on end. Um, and then if I develop a bad habit there, or not, not develop, if I see something that's a bad habit, a good example, I ran a, a goose hunt this um, fall where we had a sailor that dropped probably 300 yards out. Um, you know, we dropped three or four geese, one was crippled, ends up flying out and probably drops 300 yards out. I bring Bella up, I send her on a blind, which was nothing during the summer. Um, because we train long field trial level blinds and she will run for days, but we've been hunting. And so she hadn't had a retrieve longer than a hundred yards in the week. So I send her out, she hits a virtual wall. Um, and I can't get her past 150 yards. So I have to walk out there with her get her and send her and it's no big deal i walk 150 yards send her she's fine we get back but then you know that tuesday or wednesday during my lunch hour i set up a super long pattern blind and i work on it and i back up back up back up to where she's got all of her momentum running until she hears me stop um and so it's little things for me like that and basically during winter i hunt i work on a lot of the little obedient stuff inside the garage i mean if it's just miserable i go in the garage and i use treats um it's kind of funny because uh, a lot of people don't use treats when their dogs get older i love it obedience is super boring for a dog if i can make it interesting for her by throwing some treats in i do um she stays happy and our obedience stays stays spot on and uh so you know that's just the little things i work that and and then i try and work with her all winter long yeah yeah, I, I, I think you're, I agree with you. Um, that was why I didn't want to hunt Hondo that first year. I'm kind of like, uh, I didn't want to instill those bad habits at such an early age. 
And, you know, we're like you guys, we hunt extreme conditions, right? It's the water's cold, it's fast, and he wasn't even a year old, you know, and I'm glad, I'm glad I waited. I'm, I'm really glad I waited because it's starting to pay dividends now. He's super steady. It's funny, you talk about the old dog, that old dog kids could work. My, my old dog was like, nah, nah. <laughs> I, I was here before you came along and I'm not listening to you. He barely minds them at all, um, which he's a chill old dog anyway, so it's not a big deal. But the young dog, oh man, he'll, he minds them. He, he's 100% obedient to, well, my two daughters, my, my little boy can't talk yet, or he's just starting to talk. So, but yeah, it's really nice to have a dog that, that can handle that the whole family can handle, even though he's, you know, he's high energy, man. He's like bouncing off the walls. Most of the time they can still handle him. You know, he'll place for him. I'm excited. It's interesting to hear what you, what you said. I like your points about taking the time when you see those bad habits in the field on a hunt, taking the time at the end to brush up on those and fix it. Um, I used to do the same thing with my old dog. You know, he's, he's in the bar now. He's kind of, you get what you get out of him, but it's one of those things that when he was younger, I do the same thing, man. We go on a hunt and then come home and whatever I wasn't happy with, especially usually it was steadiness with him. Um, we'd work on steadiness, you know, for, half an hour that night when I got home just like come on dude you got this but so what does your training consist of in the summer then when you transition out of bear season you're you're I'm sure I'm sure you're like me you're every night after work it's training absolutely um I mean with with us adapting to the new normal with Graham and now he's just now getting to the point where I can throw him in a in a pack or take him out and he's sitting up on his own. Yeah. Right. Like it's it's no longer just holding a little potato that eats and poop <laughs> anymore. Um he's actually got it's some so food. true. It's so true. <laughs> um it, it, it's getting a lot easier. You know, we've had a couple of times where my wife will jump in the ranger with me and we're fortunate where we live. We've got a couple of big open fields and I can go set up a couple of dummy launchers and, and work super simple stuff. Um, and so I try and get out at least two to three times a week. Um, we've been working really trying to, and, and in my mind, remember, I'm not I'm not a pro, right? Like I'm an amateur. That's it's the right. first time I'm coming through this HRC AKC side of things, but I'm, I'm an ex athlete. I'm super competitive. I want to do things the right way. So I'm trying to watch what I see from other people and learn we're training for, for master um, at the end of this summer. And she probably could have run it this spring if we wouldn't have had Graham and I'd have really been on top of my stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, I'm trying to get at least to where I can get to some super technical water or really big factors. And, and we're, we're at the point where we're teaching the, the really intricate things right now, right? It's no longer steadiness and just marking and some hand signals. It's taking very specific hand signals away from poison birds or running angle entries, angle exits, long entries, long exits, um, all those super technical things. And I'm just trying to learn every bit of it I can from the guys that I, that I know and reach out to when I can. Um, but at least a couple of times a week, if not more, uh, you know, like you, I have a very high energy dog. Um, one of the things that I've really been focusing on this summer, I've been getting with a friend of mine that I connected and got him a puppy. He's got a, a five month old that's going through force fetch right now. And we bring his puppy out and she has to sit and watch. Um, she's a really high energy dog. So I get her out of the rig, put her on a place board and I make her sit and watch for a good 10, 15, 20 minutes till she can gather herself and calm right. down. And then I reward her. So ironically, I'm teaching some technical stuff, but even at her age, like she just needs patience. Like she's a high, high, high energy dog. Um, and so she's got to learn that you act the way that I want you to, you'll get what you want. Um, and patience has been our biggest thing that we've been working on lately. Yeah. That's it's, it's like that never goes away. It's like, I compare it to when I talk to other folks, I compare it to when I was coaching basketball at the high school level and just because these kids are, you know, juniors or seniors in high school playing varsity ball, 
we still started with fundamental drills every single night. You know, you still shoot free throws, you still do layup lines, you still work on passing and dribbling and because those things get rusty if you don't. And pretty soon it's when those fundamentals break down, you start seeing massive hiccups on the court and it trans it's no different with dogs. It's no, no different. And you're spot on. I mean, we, my little training group that we have here in Helena, we, we kind of got to the point where when you get an older dog, that's really capable of a lot, right. Yeah. That's yep. capable of running triples with a blind under the arc and a poison bird almost hitting them in the face. And they're doing all that things, right. You want to get out and you want to set up the most complicated thing ever, because every time you go out, you're wanting to see what your dog can do. Right. And we've made a conscientious effort this year to actually do the reverse um, we got together just this last week and we set up two of the most simple marks you ever could imagine. And we worked on coming to a holding blind, walking on heel at, at, at the appropriate pace up to the line, sitting and being calm on the line. If I, and me, my issue, Bella, I got down to the line and the minute I reached around and grabbed our, our shotgun and our poppers, she started getting antsy. So I said, no. I picked her up, we walked back to the holding blind and we started all over again. And I mean, I've got, she's got two dogs that have run at the grand level in HRC and Bella is ready to run master, if not the grand. And we're sitting there working on super basic line manners. Um, and honestly, we walked away from that day saying this was one of the best training days we've had in months because mm -hmm. it was just the foundation and basics. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think you're absolutely spot on for anyone that's got a dog. Those super boring things that you think they are, are probably the most useful things in your toolbox as far as having a great quality companion in the duck blind, because, mm -hmm. you know, 90% of our time in the duck blind is not retrieving. It's sitting there, it's being calm. And then when the time comes being sharp, but it, you want a good hunting companion in the blind with you. And um, I gotta say, I commend you for making the decision not to hunt Hondo this last fall. And it's probably the fact that you've already had one dog in your life. So you know the importance and the danger of starting a dog too early. Um, you know, I see a lot of people I've been fortunate to have a good dog and have a lot of friends that got dogs because they hunted with my good dog. And I see, oh, look at what my eight month old puppy is doing. Look at what my 10 month old puppy is doing. I can't wait to hunt my seven month old. And I sit there in the back of my mind in just sheer panic because they have an entire season of ingraining bad habits. When they, re if they just take the time and the patience to say, ah, is this dog really, can I walk out, sit my dog in the blind, can four people shoot in the blind with that dog? Can my dog watch another dog go pick up that bird, come back, and my dog be perfectly okay sitting there calmly, quietly, not be a nuisance in the blind? If you can answer all those things, yes, then by all means, take your dog into the blind with you. If you, can, if you can't, or if it's kind of, yeah, that dog needs to wait another year. Um, yeah. Or you or you need to be 100% focused on that dog instead of trying to shoot. You're, uh, a, hand, you're a handler. And you're a handler, handler not, not a shooter. A hunter. Exactly. And that was where, that's where I'll be the first couple hunts of next, of next season, more than likely. You know, and I, I'm already planning on that where it's like, I, I need you guys to act. I need you to hit these birds. I need you killing birds, dropping birds, because I'm not going to be shooting. And... It's just one less, one less person, you know, trying to bring down birds and I'm going to be handling the dog. You know, it's interesting. It took, it took Mackinac seven years before I could completely 100% trust him to be steady. Pro Actually, I'm going to, that's a lie. Eight before I could 100% trust him. At seven, it was about 75% of the time he'd stay right there. And and it 100% came from my first lab when I was in call when I started college. I hunted her right she, everywhere. That dog went everywhere with me. Puppy and she, if all I needed was something retrieved and somebody that would sit and be mindful and pleasant, the dog was a machine. She, I mean, blinds, anything, do anything. But she would, she was not steady. She would not honor another dog. We didn't hunt her hardly with any other dog. So when we got around her, other dogs, it was like competition time. 
And I, I think back and just cringe, Chad, because I would set that dog 50 yards. We're in a, we're in layout spread. I would put her in her, in her mutt hut or little dog blind 50 yards behind us. Because when we sat up to shoot, she was just already getting, there. Oh, dude. <laughs> I mean, she's fair catching geese as they're coming down, you know, yep. she was an incredible meat dog, incredible yep. meat dog, never lost a bird. I mean, found birds that my gosh, I mean, I, I think back on some of the stuff she did, it was like, holy smokes, but she could have been so much better if I would have known what I was doing and taken the time and been more patient. And again, I didn't do it with Mackinac and it took me a little while and we got there. And now like last season, he turned 10 last March and last season it was like, he just sit and watch and then send him. And it was almost, there was a couple of times he was like, uh, are you sure? <laughs> it's like four degrees out here today. Are you sure? <laughs> That arthritic that arthritic yeah. back is not feeling too yeah. good. I, I don't know if I want to go after this. That it's poor old that poor old dog, man. And he'd still he did everything I asked of him. Mm -hmm. And he, I we did a sage grouse hunt last year, and that was one of the things where with Mac, I didn't have a lot of waterfowl when I got him in the area that I lived, but we had tons of pheasants, tons and tons of upland pheasants and sharp tail. So that's what we did, and. Again, probably too early, but holy smokes. Talk about something that makes a retriever break. Teach them how to hunt pheasants when they're six months old. You know what I mean? You know, it's funny you say that. Um, I've been told by a number of different people that they will not, in the competition world, that they will not allow their dogs to hunt upland until at least their second hunting season. Yep. Because upland creates so many bad habits oh. um it it's really, a different it's a different demand on your dog you know it, you're asking it, different things of your of your dog well you're you're asking them to rely on their nose mm -hmm. and they're not having to do anything steadiness wise right uh, um and, they're, they're hunting it, yeah and and um mm -hmm. I, I had never even thought of that because when i got bella i i moved over you know i'm in the helena area and right. we've got decent pheasant hunting upland grouse hunting around and I got super excited to get her out because I didn't want to take my 10 year old out pheasant hunting and have them all crippled up for a few days afterwards. But then I had this conversation and they said, you know, I'd really recommend that you wait until that second season because you can start having issues with a dog trusting you on blinds um, because they're so used to using their nose they're going to get 40 yards out on a blind and they'll start hunting using their nose instead of relying on you and waiting for a whistle. After they're two years old, dogs can start differentiating between, you know, backyard play and hunting or yep. upland and yep. waterfowl. And, um, you know, you're, you're spot on on that side of things. It, it was interesting because Mackinac is, I handle him like an upland dog still to this day. He'll take a cast. He's funny because we I mean, you hunt the same spots over and over and over and over your dog gets so they know those spots too especially on these western rivers there's man he i just marvel at how how smart he is he'll you'll send him and if the bird's like floating down right in front of him poof, he's right in the river straight shot bang it's easy right but if he's got a blind he can't see the bird and i send him he will not take a straight line he runs up the bank, gets to the head of the ripple, and that crosses it so he doesn't have to swim, crosses the river, gets to the other side, and then he'll start hunting the bank. And because I hunted him on pheasants for so long, and you talk about trusting, I don't even, I've gotten to the point where I don't yell at him, I don't whistle at him, nothing. I let him hunt, and I'm most of the time, he'll, he'll have a rough idea, you know, and he'll, and he'll disappear. But he'll hunt up and down that bank for 30 seconds to a minute and he'll stop on his own and he'll look at me. And I'll be like, you know, over, back. And he'll take hand signals beautifully, but he has to be ready to do it. And <laughs> it is so frustrating as, you know, it's it's not proper. It's, but I tell you what, it I, I, I sent him two or three times last year on birds, like you were saying, that sailed. And we're talking birds in a river, in a river bottom with Russian olive that's, you don't see them, you know, they go down, but you don't know where. And yep. 
they're somewhere over there, two, three, 400 yards away, right? Send the dog. He's gone for five minutes, 10 minutes, out of sight. That's a long time to not be able to see your dog, right? And it was it was a couple times this year where the camera guy, Dan Picard, was like, dude, Max has been gone for like seven or eight minutes. You might want to go over there and look. I'm like, eh, he's hunting. He'll find, he'll find it. No sooner than I say that, boop, out he pops with a still alive Drake Mallard in his mouth. You know, he was over there hunting in that grass, hunting on his own. That's not, that's not field trial. That's not, that's not technical at all. But holy crap, is that handy to have a dog that can hunt on his own at the same time? It's and hard. They're, well, they're two different things. I mean, you're yeah. spot on, right? Like that's, that's the fun thing about dogs is that mm. there are a lot of people that train their dogs wrong that is perfectly right for their style of hunting and dogs are as smart as they are they adapt to it um i mean you and i hunt rivers right rivers are one of the worst things to do oh man the dog that you're wanting to compete in a field trial master or srs because it teaches dogs to cheat um and you need them to cheat um they have to cheat they have to I, I literally sat in a, I went and sat in an AKC judging seminar this year because I was thinking about doing a little bit of judging. And then I realized the time constraint with my, my little boy and realized right. that's not happening. <laughs> but, um, um, we, you know, we sat in there and we talked to him and said, Hey, you know, I, I understand the concept of not cheating. That's uh, for, for hunting a, a pond, right? But how can you mark a dog down that runs down the bank turns in and clearly knows where it is, but they know the more efficient way of running it. Now, if they get lost and, and they lose a bird and can't right, mark it, right. cool, mark them down on marking. But how can you truthfully mark a dog down on perseverance by cheating when that's just the proper way to hunt oh, man. in our part of the country? And 100%. You know, it's one of those things. I'll take a dog that that cheats and is safe on the river over a dog with some ribbons all day long. They're two different games, right? Yeah. Like one's hunting yeah. and one's a game. They're really fun. I've actually found, fortunately, I waited long enough to really work at. Bella's starting to understand the difference. As soon as I got back out this spring, um, you know, where she was a little bit cheaty, that first time she went and tried to cheat on me in training, I gave her a firm no here. And she turned around, I was like, oh, wait, I can't cheat anymore. <laughs> and she's like, dad, damn it, I've got to see yep. the whole time now. And mm -hmm. I send her again, bam, she's right back in it. And we have to do that every now and then. Yeah. But they understand, man. They're incredible, incredible animals. They are. They are. And, and I love it, that goes back into what we were saying about keeping those fundamentals sharp. Because it's like, okay, cheat mode off game mode on and you have to be sharp you have to be in line fundamentally sound i i think again back to the athletic and the athletics analogy the great athletes out there are 100 percent fundamentally sound they are technically savvy but they are at some point wayne gretzky talked about this and there, there's a, actually it's a I think it's a Netflix documentary. So the Netflix or Amazon, and it's got uh, it's, it's called Changing the Game or something like that. But it it, it interview a half dozen and profile a couple several just of the top tier athletes. You know, like Wayne Gretzky, um, Venus and Serena Williams. Uh, there was a basket i think it was jordan michael jordan and basketball there was a bunch and the whole point of it was they were fundamentally sound they had the fundamentals of whatever their endeavor was just dialed right once they had those at some level they had a coach who encouraged them to be creative get outside the structured play get outside the structured realm of we're going to do these three things in practice every day. Well, you want to hinder intelligence and you want to hinder creativity, just hammer that home every single day. Turn them loose, let them play. And I saw that in my high school kids. 
where when we get when I gave them unstructured time to just play pickup basketball, some of the stuff that they did, they were able to key in on the fundamental aspects that they had dialed. And pretty soon they are creating on the court. And it was it was glorious to watch. And the best coaching I ever did was when I just stood there, sat there, shut my mouth, you yeah. know, and, and let them create. But it's it's interesting, you know, you got to have that that dog that is that can be creative and can operate in an unstructured environment like hunting, but can go back, like you said, and you dial up the obedience skin and you dial up the fundamentals and they can do it. I, I think it's super important to differentiate between that. I, I really do. 100%. And I mean, I, I will say it's interesting. The more I go to these, the more I find there are a handful of dogs that do some hunting sure. um, that are in this game, right? Um, a, a lot of them that are super, super competitive in this world. I mean, they spend a lot of time on pros trucks running around very similar to the horse racing world. Um, and they're with those pros that have incredible knowledge and talent of what they're doing. And then they come back and hunt with their owners a little bit in the fall, but they aren't necessarily diehard waterfowl dogs the way that, you know, Hondo and Mac are for you or Buster and Bella are for me. Um, right. But it, it is a really fun thing. And I take a special amount of pride that I've got one of those dogs that gets after it on the hunting side of things and has a lot of opportunity to create a lot of bad habits, but still comes back and hangs with the big dogs. Um, there you go. There you and, go. and it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's been neat to watch. I, since last time we talked, Bella's sire is a dog named stroker he won the srs crown championship which is the biggest dog i mean it is the world right. series of dogs there is one dog against all other dogs he won it this last year wow i wow. know he's a he's a phenomenal hunter um two of her litter mates have since achieved their hunting retriever championship um one of his litter her litter mates at the same age passed the grand this last fall and achieved his master hunter title already it's a dog uh named tombs owner's name is kelly corsi and he's running around with clark kennington too who is the pro that trains stroker and these dogs get after it. i mean they're phenomenal hunters and they also get after it in this side of things it's just fun to watch man um i'm going off on tangents on that too no I, no i love it this, that's what makes for a good podcast <laughs> well I, and I, I mean that's that's the fun part about all of it is because i look back and i'm like gosh dang it i've got one of the dogs that can do this i just don't have you know our side of the world is not known for these the hunt tests inside of things because right i mean you can't run a hunt test anywhere from september october to april in montana or anywhere in you know i think the earliest ones that you might get some over in the coast in oregon or washington um a little later in the year and then you'll get utah as early as april right. but i mean they're they're running they're running hrc tests and akc tests literally year round down south yep. um because they can uh they don't they don't experience the same stuff that we do um and they can get out and train you're right. Although, although the heat that they're dealing with right now, I wouldn't. No thanks, it's, man. It's early morning training, oh. or it's northern. It's big northern trips. Yeah. I know a, a number yeah. of different pros that'll bring their dogs up, but gas has hammered them this year. Oh my um, gosh! Yeah, our, that 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 alone is enough to get guys going. I know for me, it's like eh, we're really limiting the stuff we do. You know, I'm really working in the backyard a lot, which brings up a whole other set of, of problems because once we get outside the backyard, guess what? There's distractions all over the place. The nose starts going, the instincts kick over and it's like, all right, I need 15 minutes to just let him romp around. And then, then we can drill down. Then we can start working. You know? Well, you, you brought up a really good point there. I've made it to the ground, our grounds in Butte, you know, it's about an hour drive for me. I've made it there twice all year this year because right. I mean, it, you know, it costs 30 or 40 bucks every time to make that drive down because of gas. and it, it's just hard to do it. Um, and, and I feel for the pros. I mean, our, our HRC event is coming up in three weeks and we lost 30 plus dogs out of that event because really pros, pros can't make the trip from Texas. I mean, you know, they just can't justify hauling a 
30 dog trailer with diesel to make it down. I'm writing so, down an idea for a blog that we just hit on. <laughs> hey, you know what? If you get anything out of this podcast that's actually useful, at least you'll get some blog content because Lord knows you probably lost subscriptions last time you put me on a podcast. Don't, don't even go there. <laughs> don't even go there. It was so bad. I had to talk. I had to convince Ike to have you on again. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, man, this is, this is good stuff. This is great conversation because it's, I, I, so last, last, it was Sunday. Again, we're stayed home. Worked around the house, you know, honestly saving money so we could go do stuff on the fourth. You know, it's like we want to go take the drift boat and go fishing, you know, an hour and a half. That doesn't have an engine. (laughs) Nope. And it's kind of like, okay, uh, better save money this weekend so we can go fishing next weekend, you know. Anyway, there's those types of things. But Sunday afternoon after church, and I looked at my wife and I said, you know what, let's let's go to the mountains. Let's just run up there real quick and let's take the dogs. I mean, the dogs are just like Jones and to get out of the house, right? They're bored in the backyard. Took the kids, loaded up the kids, threw the little man in a backpack, which you're going to love the backpack, by the way. It is game changer. Takes your mountain fitness training to a new level. Cause, you know, <laughs> Mine goes up to about 40 pounds, 50 pound capacity, but my little guy's already almost too big for it. He weighs 35. So but the point of this is it was an opportunity again to work with the dogs in a non-traditional format where it's almost like socialization because the old dog he's fly fished with me since he was a puppy he knows to it he sits at heel he he gets to lick the fish when i get one you know he knows he's allowed to roam when we're hiking but not take off, you know, and Hondo's learning all this, you know, all these spells, you know, oh, that's, what's that? Oh my goodness. There's a, there's a moose track. Holy smokes, you know, and all these different things. And he sees the water was the first thing he does <laughs> splash. I'm like, dude, I was going to fish that. Come on, man. But it's all training because by the end of the day, I'd step up to a spot to fish. He'd be heel and just sit there. And be like, oh, now I know what we're doing. I'm not supposed to go in there until you tell me. You know, um, I have to stay where you can see me. You know, I can't just run off. I can't. And he's, I'm sure Bella is the same way. He's so fast. He covers so much ground. And he's a big dog for a, for a Brit. He's big. You know, he's, I'll bet you, I haven't weighed him in a few weeks, but I'll bet you he's pushing 75 pounds. Ooh. And he's just solid muscle. And hasn't you know? filled out and hasn't even remotely filled out yet. He's not even two, you yeah. know, and, and it's like, whoa. And so I know out of, out of the Southern Oak Kennel line, Hank is their big dog. You know, he's like 80 right. plus and he's a bruiser. Hondo's gonna be pushing it because he's he's got the frame, man. He dwarfs Mackinac. And Max like a normal sized British lab, and he dwarfs right. him. He dwarfs him. Yeah. But yeah, he's, he covers so much ground so fast that it's like, yeah, you need to be over here. You know, thankfully, I forgot my whistle like a moron. Thankfully, the kid pack has a whistle built into the chest strap. So I was like, beep, beep, beep. Here he'd come. You know, he's over there snuffling around in this willow patch. And all the only way I could, reason I could tell where he is, is the willows are moving, you know. <laughs> and he's very intent on something. And I, I looked at my wife and I was like, if he spooks a moose calf, if he flushes a moose calf out of that patch, Run. we're in trouble. And I whistle him up, he came right to me. You know, it was it was like, those are valuable things that I don't think we always think about as training opportunities, where it's every single day. My dogs don't live in a kennel. They're in the house with us. They're out in the yard. They go places with us. You know, we... We do as much stuff as we can with them. And I think that exposure and the fact that, hey, guess what? You have to heal at home. You have to heal out here, too. You have to come when you're called. You have to do all these things. You know, I don't know. What what do you do? Because I know you're an avid outdoorsman. You don't just waterfall hunt. You don't just train dogs. No. Um, 
Well, I mean, as far as getting outdoors, you know, I, I like, I actually like to spend a lot of time during the summer and uh, up at our, our in-laws lake house. They've got a lake house, which I'm not complaining about at all. They're rebuilding <laughs> it this year. So we're not spending as much time there. Um, years past. Is that up on the flathead? It's a, at Canyon Ferry. Okay, cool. Um, we're not quite at the level of a flathead lake house. Oh, but okay, sorry. They, you know, eh, well. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we'll, we'll be spending a lot of time up there. And like you said, um, it's not a fenced yard. So one of the things that's really crucial in that, I when I have my dogs anywhere that is not fenced, they have an e-collar on. I never use the actual stimulation functions. I have both of my dogs trained to recall on the beep function. On tone, yep. On tone. So, and it's something that's worked very well for me on windy days hunting and when I'm out at the lake. And I, you know, I don't want to be sitting there out at the lake drinking a beer and have to whistle my dogs back to me if they start, if they decide they want to go after a squirrel, right? Right. But I also have the ability that if we go, and we're sitting on the beach at the lake house that I can tell both dogs to lay down. And they, for me, down is just like sit. It means yep. stay. It means so, stay. Yep. So both, I put them both down and they are not intended to move. And um, so if kids walk by or other dogs walk by, down means down. And, and you know, having that foundation means I don't have dogs that run and, and run up in the face of other dogs. I don't have dogs that run up on little old lady that's walk that's out power walking at 8 a.m. and breaks her hip. Um, you know, it, it's it's the control in that nature and in public that's huge for me. And it, it's that side of things translates into having a safe dog, both for others and for themselves. Um, you know, one thing that I that's a really odd one that I've tried to train into my dogs is sit when they see a vehicle. Um, huh, so, yeah. so, so every time we see a vehicle in the neighborhood or I walk them, when I go get my mail every single day, we have one of those mailboxes at the front of the neighborhood. When I go get my mail, they walk at heel off lead so we can practice that. And if we see vehicles, I give them a sit. Um, and I want to be able to give them a remote sit when we're running around in the neighborhood. If they aren't on heel, I want to be able to quickly tell them sit. And it's not necessarily, they, they, they look at me for a command, right? But their butt is, when I see the 16 year old driving through the neighborhood way too fast, which used to concern me as a dog owner, it's 10 times worse now that I'm a father. Welcome um, to fatherhood, dude. You whippersnappers, <laughs> slow your ass down. Um, and I'll get it. It's worse. Dude. Every kid you have. This is a neighborhood of children. Yeah. And, um, Every kid you, know. you have, the Papa Bear syndrome gets intensified. Let me tell you. <laughs> Everybody talks about Mama Bear this, Mama Bear that. Well, let me tell you something. Papa Bear is a force to be reckoned with, buddy. Dude, so kids it, driving too fast. Hey! Exactly. Oh, so man. you know when I when I see that going through, I can give my dogs a firm sit, and they're safe, right? And and that's why they have an e collar on. But you know. I think randomly last week or a couple of weeks ago, I took Bella with me to Home Depot um, just for grins, right? And a lot of people want to pet her and they want to love her and she's excited. And I just stop them and I say, hey, absolutely, you can pet her, but do me a favor, walk up to her and don't touch her unless she's set it, setting down. Um, don't, like if she's up on all fours, don't pet her. If she starts to jump up or get excited, don't pet her. If she's sitting and patient, pet her. Yep. Um, and then, you know, I try and think about what else I do all summer long. And I don't know other than that. I mean, I really do train dogs a lot. Like it's, it's stuff. It's, that, yeah. It's stuff that we do in the moment. You know, yeah. like you said, you take, you take them places with you and it gets forewarn you. It gets, I'm sure you're not just going to have one kid. I mean, I hope, I hope you have more than that if that's what you want, but it gets harder the more kids you have, because obviously your kids take precedence over your dogs. Right. And it gets really hard when you run to, to Cody or Billings to take the dog into shields with you, you know, and you got three kids and a dog. It's like, okay. Just like hurting cats. At that uh, point. It's, it's, it's a disaster. And you've got to, you got to know what hills you're willing to die on, you know, where it's kind of like we went fishing, to, went to a reservoir, I don't know, a month ago now. And it wasn't a very nice day. It was kind of rainy and muddy and it was really wet. Um, 
dust all the flooding we had down here and uh i took i took hondo i didn't take mac um i took hondo because i thought this would be a good opportunity to work on staying out of water being under control and the fishing was lights out i mean my two kids i all of my attention was on taking fish off the hook and baiting hooks that's all i had time to do i went i went and put hondo back in the truck i was like dude i'm sorry but i know we came all the way down here we went down a back road on the way home and i let him out and i rode it with with the pickup i just <laughs> let him run for about four miles you know what i mean so i'm like dude We've I'm, all been there. I'm sorry buddy i'm sorry but knowing when knowing when to put the dog up is just as important as knowing when to take it with you and yeah go ahead. And, and knowing those times that are strictly for the dog too absolutely right? absolutely um, you have took, to have those you have to have those we we took we we we've been out fishing a couple of times this spring with my buddy that that has his five month old and you know he was running around on a lead and and we were just practicing with him sitting at heel hanging out while we were fly fishing so he didn't get hooked right um and, and that day we didn't catch a single fish but the dog learned a lot of lessons there you go um and, and and that was a win in and of itself. So, you know, we we've done a little bit of fishing this summer on that side of things, but but like you said, um, you've got to know when to put the dog up. Yeah, you know, just sometimes. And that that's in hunting too, right? You get yes, out there and, and 100%. It, it starts out at 25 degrees, and all of a sudden, before you know it, you get a cold front that comes through and it's negative six, and you're like, ah, buddy you're going to have to just sit there and stay warm. I'm not putting you back in that water again. Right. Right. Um, and that one's no longer for the dog, right? Like you've got to, that's when you got to put the dog up. At, I think that what I didn't intentionally mean to go down that, down that road, but you're, but I'm glad you, I'm glad you took it there. So much of dog ownership is knowing when, when not to use your dog, when to leave, leave the dog at home or when, not to put a dog in the water man i think i think back on some of the stuff i did with Mackinac when he was when he was young and i'm sure i took a couple of years off his life just by situations you know some of the conditions that we hunted in um there was one time oh chad i, I came so close to losing him on the bighorn river that and it was nothing it was no fault of his or any fault of my own the day was nice but we'd had a big cold snap and the river had iced up really, really bad. And I waited, there was one day where it was just like flowing chunks of ice. I'm like, yeah, we're not hunting this crap. But I waited a couple of days, it cleared out pretty good, but there was a big, big ice, big, big piece of anchor ice that had formed on an island, on like a, like a gravel bar basically. Yep. And it was upstream, I don't know, Two, three hundred yards of where we were hunting and it was anchored man i mean you could walk all over it and like it's not going anywhere and last bird of the evening i mean there's 30 minutes of shooting like left this big drake mallard comes sailing in and then what do, and what do i do instead of making a clean shot in the decoys i miss i miss him first two times I kill him on the third going away and he sails down dives on the other side of the river and then floats down and gets in a back eddy so Mac not being, you know, being younger dog and not being steady at that point, he's on it, you know, and he's swimming down, getting after the bird, didn't think anything of it. I'm walking down the bank, you know, just kind of keeping an eye on things. And I happen to look over and here comes that giant piece of ice. And I'm talking, this thing is a hundred yards long by 25 yards wide. This is a freight train of ice coming down the river. And I'm and it's, it's barreling right down on my dog. And I was just like, no, oh my gosh. And he's right at the bird. And I start hollering, come on, buddy, come on, buddy, come on, buddy. You know, trying to get him excited and get him sped up. He grabbed the bird, turned, and you could see it, Chad. The, out of the corner of his eye, he saw that ice and he was like, his eyes got big. And he turned on the jets and, boom, and swam right away from it. And it didn't even, it didn't turn out to even be close. But when Close he initially go, oh, when he initially grabbed the bird, I'm thinking this is it. I, I, he's gone. But then the river had widened out at that point. By the time the ice got, you know, 
where I thought it was going to catch him, the, ri the river had widened out. It got a little slower. The ice slowed down. And of course, he's swimming faster than the ice. You know, ice can't swim, you know. So right. mm -hmm. he takes off. And I was like, holy smokes. You know, and he Deep gets. Breath. Yeah, he gets to the bank, heals like perfectly, gives me the bird, and I'm just like, dude, let's go home. Give oh you the my bird. gosh, gives you, you know. Gives you the bird, then gives you the bird. And yeah, then... <laughs> exactly. And he didn't know. He was just happy. He's like, yeah, cool. You know, I got one. But, you know, I think about like, I he was, he got hypothermic on me one time when he was young. Yeah. He, yeah. Got, he got hypoglycemic on me another time when he was young. The hypoglycemia one was weird because I'm watching him and I'm like, it was the end of a hunt. He didn't want to go on a retrieve. I had a crippled goose that I dispatched on the ice on the other side of the river. And I'm like, dude, just swim over there and get it. You don't even have to get out on the ice. You can literally grab it in from right. the water and let's go. And he was like, uh-uh, I don't want to get in that water. He was just yep. like really hesitant, you know. And I forced him like an idiot. I forced him. He swam over there, got the bird, comes out. And he always delivers birds to hand. I mean, always. Geese, okay. But he drops this one. He didn't even bring it up the bank. He drops it, crawls out, and he's like hunched up, like something's wrong. And I'm like, crap, he's hypo. He's, um, he's got hypothermia. Yep. I'm looking at him. I'm like, and I stick my hand up under his vest, you know, and he's warm to the touch. And I'm like, he's not. This isn't the same thing. And then it dawned on me. I was like, holy crap, he's bonking. I've, I've seen my athletes do this yep. you know Christmas basketball tournaments where you play three games in a day and you got kids cramping up and they're bonking and they don't because they don't take care of themselves you know so I call the vet right there and he goes you got a Snickers bar with you and I went yeah I got a bunch of those little fun sized ones he's like give him two or three until he perks up and as soon as he perks up don't give him any more I said well what about chocolate he's like nah He's like, that's milk chocolate. He's like, doesn't affect him at all. Not a thing. Well, I tell you what, that that's turned into a staple for that dog. He's just like, he brings me a bird. He sits there like, you got my thing handy bar for me, Dad? <laughs> 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 but I think about that, you know, how, how hard that we push and we forget sometimes the damage we can do or we're so serious that it's like, man, take the time, take the dog to us, some family stuff, take them to Home Depot with you, take them, take them places and let them have fun. It should be having, you should be enjoying that dog. If the only time your dog gets to leave the house is when you're going hunting, they're going to be an animal every time they leave yeah. the house. Yep. Um, I mean, you're pretty much spot on with that one. So I like what you said there, that, you know, because we can't, it's, it's the same with your kids. If you never take your kids out in public, they're going to be turds every time you take them out. Or you're going to be that like, weird kid that's in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> you're sitting next to the dog. They're down there playing Fortnite or something. Recording recording a podcast on waterfowl. <laughs> hey, I'm, this isn't a basement. This is my office. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... Uh, yeah, man. It, it is so so funny you know we get so uptight about dogs and i found myself getting uptight about hondo you know wanting to do everything right and wanting to follow you know training protocols and doing this and doing that you know knowing knowing the mistakes i made with Mackinac and with with um josie and then the lab we had gets kids growing up and it's like dude chill out enjoy the process enjoy the fact that it's not perfect you're gonna have good days you're gonna have bad days and then it's the end result that matters it's you the it, <clears throat> it and it's the journey right yeah, like yeah. that's that's the cool thing is we all get a, we all get something in our minds of what the picture perfect dog that we want is and we want so quickly to go from a to z like you said the 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 end result is what matters but taking the time to do it right and enjoying that journey along the way is where you have all your fun right i mean 100%. It, it's, it's not as it's not as much fun to immediately get out and get your dog hunting as early and soon as they can um when you can take your time take that time period to make sure that they have all the foundation right learn all those things and the first time they're hearing a duck call isn't in the duck blind 
um, or in the goose blind, you know, teaching them all that stuff, having all that fun, introducing them to them, but also going and doing all the other life things that way hunting, it's what they really enjoy, but it's just another part of their really good life. Um, it's funny you say that and I'm going to, again, transition, not transition, but, but draw a parallel because you sound like a, like a young Jedi master (laughs) right now. Right. But you've only got one Padawan and we could say again, the same thing about kids because as parents and I'm, I mean, as parents, we get in a hurry being like, I want, I can't wait for my kid to do this. I can't wait for my kid to do that. Or we get, I am so guilty of getting hung up on, you know, why can't, why, why can't he walk better? You know, why, why can't, why can't you, why can't you say that word? You know, why can't, it's like, dude, enjoy this process because guess what? You get those feeds, those on Facebook, you know, those feeds that pop up memories or whatever they are. And I look back and here's memories of my four-year-old who's now my seven-year-old. And I'm like, wow, that happened so fast. And it's even faster with dogs. Oh, absolutely. And, and it's crazy because you make a good point. And obviously I'm so fresh into it. Um, you know, Kelly and I were looking a, a week or two ago, just looking through our phones at the photos we were getting when he was two months old and we were like oh my gosh it's so it's so fast i missed that little kid already but like like right now his new thing he's getting close to rolling over right and you're like oh he's almost got it he's almost got it he's almost got and you're ready for him to do the next thing the next thing the next thing but then when you actually stop to to relish in the little moments like he's just really learned how to giggle And, you know, I can really goose him with my chin or kind of blow raspberries on his stomach and he giggles. And it's just the greatest thing in the world. And I I feel like we are at least doing a good job of of not wishing it by too fast. Yeah, Um, it's a natural thing, dude. I'm just teasing you, giving you a hard time. But it's it's a totally natural thing to be. Everyone does it. I mean, all all you can think of is, man, I really can't wait till he sleeps through the night or man, I can't wait. (laughs) I, I can't wait till he can hold his bottle and feed himself so I can brush my teeth in the morning. Right. And then you're like, Oh man, I really want to feed him. Um, I really, you know what I mean? Um, I kind of miss those, those middle of the night snuggles or whatever else. And and you miss that puppy face too. Yeah. Um, yep. And, and there's so many things with a young dog that you get to teach, right? I, 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 that that six month old puppy, they're a sponge. That eight month old puppy, literally every time you go out, you're teaching them something new and it's so much fun. You want to move on to the next thing. And the, 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 that foundation, like you said, again, I commend you for, for realizing it with this dog. And it, it only took you two dogs of mistakes to realize it before you got to this one. Um, but you realize that slow is fast, just like the old, the Navy SEAL mentality, slow is fast and fast is deadly. Um, the faster you move your dog through all that stuff, no matter how talented they are, the more bad habits you're going to create. There are certain things just like kids, dogs have to emotionally and mentally mature to be able to handle certain scenarios. If you've got a puppy that can sit there and honor your older dog at six months in the backyard with a bumper, it does not mean that they need to go out into a hunting blind yes. and, and honor that dog with when they're out there hunting. Yep. They need to enjoy that first season, those first few hunts by themselves. Make sure that you have that thing just rock solid or you're going to create a bunch of bad habits and you're going to miss it. Yep. Um, Cause dogs, I mean, dogs don't learn by watching other dogs. No, not, not the type of things that we want them to learn. At least they might learn how to, you know, wine, open a, open a cabinet door or yeah. wine or bark, all the bad habits that we don't want. Yeah. That's what they learn from other dogs. They don't learn how to be good from other dogs. It's like your kids don't learn how to be good from other kids. They learn how to be good from you. And and good parenting. Exactly. Just like good training exactly. and being a good handler. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. Well, wow. Where, we should write a book. book. We should write a book. book. Parenting and dog training. <laughs> a, a memoir. A memoir from a basement. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh man. Well, what is, are your what are your waterfowl cool. plans for this fall? You are you gonna you, uh, did I convince you with all my photos of my swan last year? You're gonna put in for a Montana swan or what? I am gonna put in for some swans uh, stuff. I I drew a because of the because of the way the big game stuff is structured here, the way our print dates go out for the magazine, we have uh, our Christmas issues go out. Both of them are scheduled to go out a week apart in October this year. And so I am, while everybody else stop chasing stuff around in October, big game wise, I'm in the office and, and that's okay. I get, I get some free time. If I plan, I get some free, I can get some free time in September, but November is when my big game season's really, I can really get after it. Unfortunately for us here in Wyoming, um, that's very limited, very, very limited. And I drew a stellar mule deer rut hunt this year, 2.4% chance. And I drew it. I've been applying for this hunt for 15 years and I finally drew the tag. Um, so that, that has my ultimate focus in November. I won't be hunting. I will I may get out and chase sage grouse early um, because I, I'm really worried about it, about a listing. Uh, about an ESA listing on sage grouse and I really like my kids to at least experience one sage grouse hunt so I might take the dogs and go out and do that um but yeah I it's going to be interesting um I'm well, there's been some talk about some early goose in North Dakota there's been some talk about swans obviously um obviously a lot of local stuff is in the works again um we've talked about a a pheasant trip a pheasant hunt in south dakota so just lots of things lots of things in the works that you know we'll have to play by ear and see what happens last year we were blessed with tons and tons of waterfowl here locally we had an awesome year just an awesome year and just numbers of birds that were ridiculous and it was really really good so that was that was awesome but i don't know i don't know other than i don't have anything big like canada or anything like that on the horizon but what about you what are you going to do well much like you i somehow randomly pulled a big game bull elk tag here by my house congratulations uh, with a under five percent chance of drawing um so i'm i'm going to be spending most of my september and october with that one um i decided to put in for a party tag i might be the unluckiest antelope person <laughs> in all of montana i have six points in montana i don't even know that's possible like i think i'd i, I would legitimately be surprised if i don't have more points than anyone else in montana for antelope um, but I put in, I decided I was wanted to try and get my dad up here to shoot an antelope. Um, so we put in as a party, he had no points. So we'll have a combined, you know, yeah. rounded up four points for the drawing this year. And I still should have an extremely like 95% chance of drawing, um, even cutting my points in half. Um, but aside from that, um, I think I've talked with Riza a little bit, my boss at RMEF. We are looking into possibly doing an Oregon duck hunt. Oh, um, cool. She, she wants me to bring my fancy dogs over and, and pick up the birds for everybody. Um, and then aside from that, hopefully I can draw a swan again. Um, that was a really just neat experience. That was my first time getting to hunt swan on the actual, like the swan hunt up here, right? When there's right thousands upon thousands of birds and you literally just lay in a ditch and wait for one to fly over mm -hmm. um i mean i took two dogs for one bird last year um and and it was great i let my little dog honor the whole time so my big dog could go pick up so i literally took her on a hunt knowing full well she would not get a retreat right. um and it was phenomenal for her um and so i'm hoping i draw that again so I can take her and actually let her pick one up this year, yeah. even though those swans are the size of her. Um, and then, you know, we had a phenomenal, phenomenal goose season last year. I, I think you might've seen some of the videos. I mean, we had some videos of literally thousands of birds being on top of us, which is not normal for central Montana. 
Yeah. Um, it, it can happen, but I mean, these were like lights out. We filled our five man limit before the flight even started. Oh, kind wow. Of yeah, those, um, are good, those are the good days. And then I'm just really hoping upon all hope, because you know, this is dearest to my heart that we actually get weather that coordinates with the golden eye this year, because last year's golden eye season was the worst one we've had in five years. Um, we had a wicked cold front that just froze everything. And I don't know if all the golden eye just decided to just keep going right on down to Wyoming and Utah, or they just never made it. Or I, 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 I to this day, I don't know what happened. The huh. golden eye never showed up on the Missouri, like they normally do for us. And, um, we had a tear I'm, I'm the golden eye guy. Right. I mean, like I got a recipe, this whole podcast came up because I got a recipe from Montana fish, wildlife and parks about golden eye burgers. And I literally opened it thinking it would be some kind of duck. And they were talking about the golden eye fish. fish. And I'm like, that, oh, the that's fish. Not right. You don't refer to fish as golden eye. There is one golden eye in this world and it flies. Um, and so, oh man, the tarpon of the, the tarpon of the West is what they were talking about. Oh, that's ridiculous and absurd. And they should change the name of that fish. Um, so I am hoping amongst all hope that the golden eye come back in droves this year so that I can literally waste thousands of dollars on ammunition, not being able to hit those little armor plated bastards. Well, um, we had, they, they went south of us this year. We didn't have a ton of them around, but I don't pay much attention to them anyway. I, I always <laughs> have my eyes peeled for a Barrows um, and didn't see one last year, but down where, down where we spent most of our time hunting, we don't see a lot of golden eyes, but I know places where we could go kill all the limits of golden eyes you want to kill. It's like, I mean, come, that's what get, that's come what on gets down. my blood pumping. Come on um, down. I'll put you on I, all more golden eyes than you could, than you can shake a stick at. I felt terrible. I, I literally, all I did was talk up the golden eye hunting all last year. And I finally convinced Christian Hogue from Fioki to go with me last year on a hunt. And it was negative three when we left the boat oh. ramp. Oh. I had like, I, it was hard to keep our propane heater lit it was so cold by the time we got on our island and we shot two birds oh and, and it was depressing and i felt terrible and i'm pretty sure he will never go on a hunt with me again um <laughs> and i noticed that when he went on a pheasant hunt this spring i didn't get an invite either so there might Imagine be that. A little in there. oh that's hilarious that's hilarious but, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll holler at you dude and and let you come down and you and scott reekers can go shoot all the golden eyes that's i I, I, I mercilessly tease him he doesn't when he you know he's pretty he's new he's still new he's only been waterfall hunting for I don't know, four years something like that and maybe five and so back when he first started man a duck was a duck it didn't matter what it was right he just, it's a duck Shuggler, it's dropping golden eye it's it. dropping shoot merganser it. i will take it and i tell you what he's gotten to the point where he's like you know we hear that and i'm like no i don't, have to, I don't, I don't even have to say it anymore and he's steady he's just like i'm like good boy it's Good like boy. training a dog. You've it's got exactly to what it is. Your... <laughs> You're not allowed to shoot those in my blind. <laughs> Hey, you know what? If you're good to Reekers, he might help you out with that mule deer tag because I hear that he's pretty solid on the mule deer glassing game. He he spends a lot of time in the backcountry in in late July and August, and when our general season opens on the western side of the state, um, that's his thing. That he loves doing that, and he gets after it. And he's killed some nice deer the last couple of years, so he's that that mule deer is his thing. You know, we joke on the big game side. You're one of two types in out west. You're either a mule deer guy or you're an elk guy. And I'm an elk guy. I don't know. There's something about them big, stinking, smelly, loud things that I just I love them. I just can't get enough. And I but it's funny, the more the more kids I have, the more I like animal hunting. It's Animal's like just fun. Oh, dude! Like dude. it's not it's not that much effort. No, and, and don't get me wrong. Like if you're trying to if you're trying to do a record book, oh, animal, different story. Like it's a whole yeah yeah that's a whole different ball game. 
but it is such a fun i actually it's funny you say that i took kelly just a real quick story um because i know that i'm like just eating up your tape over there at this you're fine you're fine we're Um, in great shape we took uh i took kelly with me i had an antelope doe tag this year i've still never shot an antelope buck because like i said in six years i can't i can't draw the tag um you need to start so flying down here brother I'll i've tell been you what. buying i've been buying antelope points for wyoming and how many do you have that, how many do you uh, have four or five. Oh. um but Buy it doesn't antelope. matter because they just cut non-resident tags in Wyoming, so it's going to get that much harder in wyoming they only cut they, that 90 10 is only for the big five they didn't cut it for cut for antelope too no Hallelujah. I thought no. I've been wasting my no. points. All right. No, you're still, it it's still 80 20 for, it's still 80 20 for elk deer. Well, it's 84 16 for elk, but it's still, you know, 80 20 for deer and antelope. That was a big, that was a big piece of confusion. And, and, you know, we wrote a blog on that on the Eastman side. And it's like, I hate to say it, but nobody reads. It's my own dad was like, I can't believe this crap. Bah, 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 bah. I said, Dad. It's for sheep, moose, goat, bison, and grizzly bears, which we don't even have a hunt for grizzly bears. But if we do, it'll be a 90-10 tag application or tag allocation. And all people saw was the headline. And that I, is... do, I do read if I get the time, but you know I work for another organization that also puts content uh-huh. out. It's uh-huh. really hard to read other people's No, content. I hear you. I hear you. And that's, that's just something that we've been battling that that misconception but yeah well, dude, if you got that, if you got four points if you got four four antelope points buy another one here if you didn't if you didn't apply this year buy one in the in the point buy and let's talk during application season next year because with five points i got some areas where you could come down i'll put you on a nice buck we can do that yeah well so back <laughs> to this fun story um yeah, i take sorry. my wife at seven and a half months pregnant so that point where she's really starting to get uncomfortable mm-hmm. and and we go we go truck hunt here in the area where because i mean we just let the glass do all the work for us and we're riding around and there's a lot of people with buck tags and it's world war three right like it's opening day and everyone with buck tags i'm staying away from them letting them do their thing we're driving around and we see two bucks crest over the edge of a hill and there are no other hunters around and i'm like okay I guarantee you all these bucks are running around with those. There's going to be a doe on the other side of this hill. So we get out and I've got Kelly behind me. I've got my pack on and we're kind of like scuttle walking, right? She's again, seven and a half months pregnant. She worked out the entire time of her pregnancy. So she was still in good shape, but she's not in running after antelope no, shape. At no, that point. she's pregnant. And so I turn around and I power walk everywhere I go. People that elk hunt with me hate elk hunting with me. People that like hunt with me, period, they hate it because I'm halfway gone and they're 50 yards behind me. Well, I turn around and look, she's 75 yards behind me. I'm like, wait a second. This is supposed to be me and my wife going and doing this for fun. Like, hold on. Up please. here right now. Get up here. I could have, <laughs> but I was like, okay, I'm just going to wait. Not that big a deal. And so I wait for her to get there and I'm like, all right, here's the deal. We're going to crest up this hill. When I get to the other side of it, these antelope are on the other side and I guarantee you there's going to be a doe there. So I'm just going to crawl up. I'll get down and just, just stay with me, stay close and we'll move. And so we get up there and we're at that point where I need to start bear crawling. Right. And so I'm bear crawling to crest over this hill and I come over over this hill and I know she's behind me a little ways. Cause you know, I don't want to blow her ears out with a muzzle break or any of that jazz. And I also don't know if it's going to cause any damage to the baby hearing a big muzzle break go off. Probably not a thing, but no, new no. father, you're worried about oh, literally yeah. if the no, wind blows no. the wrong direction. So I crest over and all of a sudden I see all three of their heads whoop, turn and look right at me. And I'm like, there's no way they see me. Boom. They take off. And I turn around and here's my wife standing up, just barely creeping. She did not. Cr- and I look at her and I'm like, what 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 are you doing she's like i'm not crawling are you kidding me it looks like a, i look like a, i look like a teeter-totter out there trying to belly crawl just completely refused to crawl at all and so and i'm like at this point i'm not even mad right i'm like i'm no, laughing this is no. fun. This a great experience they run a giant thousand yard circle and i kid you not i look up and they're coming right back to where they were and i tell kelly just kneel down here and they're, they're just going to come right back. And so I lay down on the sticks. Sure enough, 100%, within 10 yards, they come back 
after 10 minutes, right where they were. I get up, they're 100 yards away. I shoot, runs off. The two bucks are running. They stop. The doe dies within 50 yards. The bucks turn around and look, turn, and then they run off and hightail. And I turn around, and mama has seven and a half month pregnant crocodile tears coming down out of her eyes. And she goes, they just, they just looked back at her and, and they looked at her and they saw, they saw her dying and then they just ran away and left her. It was just so sad. Those hormones, and dude. All it's those pregnancy those, hormones. Oh my gosh. And it yes. was just, it, it was the funny, she wasn't, she wasn't like upset that the antelope no, died. No. She was upset that the two other antelope left her. <laughs> it is, welcome to the journey, brother. Welcome to the journey. It, it was awesome. It was yeah. fantastic. And, I got uh, one more. I got one more piece of parenting advice. Okay. And then, and then I'll let you go on that one. I'll quit harping on you, young fellow. But uh, the you talk about you know the stuff you worry about as a new dad, you know, and you're all protective. Or you know, I don't know. And I, I there was a saying, and it's that I heard when I was about in your shoes. The first one's glass. The second one's rubber. And the third one is like silly putty. I mean, it's, it's seriously, I, I grab my son by his arm and sling him around. And if I can't get a hold of him, I just grab whatever body parts easiest to get a hold of and drag him out. You know, it's just like after, after two, after, yeah, no. But the first one, oh man. Oh, you're like, oh, I get, uh, you know, and yeah, they, it's just, it's like, it's again, puppies. You have your first oh. puppy and you're you're so careful and you're and you don't want to do this and the next but after that you're like oh yeah whatever you know it's not going to change the outcome <laughs> no, no but anyway dude i had a really good time visiting with you and uh and like always we have a good time and i'm serious about the golden eyes and i'm serious about the antelope you want to come down I'll get a hold of you for the golden eyes. Let you know we get, it's got to get cold, you know, because yep. it's got to push them down here. Yep. But we could even meet up in uh, Montana. There's a couple places not far from here that we can hunt uh, golden eyes on. And uh, but yeah, when it comes to the antelope, buy another point, and then let's talk application time next year, and we'll make that happen because it's it's pretty cool. That works there's, for me. If you uh, if if you decide to put in for Swan up here, let me know. You got a place to stay. We're not. I appreciate. We're not it. too far, so I appreciate uh, it. Make it work and and get some cell phone video content. I gotta I gotta actually bring my boat up there and have Adipose um, redo it and yep. do, some, do some work on it after six years of beating the piss out of it on these western rivers. It's starting to look that way. Yeah. And so I'll holler at you when I bring the boat up, and we'll just hang out and do something. Sounds great, brother. Cool, man. Well, have fun training dogs and have fun being a dad. And uh, I'll catch you on the flip side. Sounds good, man. It's great talking to you. Yep. See ya.